but uh, I want to point a couple things out. <clears throat> Number one, appreciate so much uh, the generous giving of the offering last week for the bus. Had some senior adults ask me, said, well, will that cover it? And, and the answer is no. And they said, well, some of us can give more. So that will be totally up to you. But thank you for your gracious giving last week. Also, what a fantastic football season our senior team is having. Amen. I tell you, they have played hard. They have done well, and we are very, very proud of you guys. Just two more, guys, two more, and we've got a state championship. All right. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Uh, let's open up the Word of God, and we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 6, and that's Looking Unto Jesus series, and it's uh, time to grow, now grow. We've talked about uh, the theme of spiritual maturity, and... Uh, I don't know how many of you follow football. I, I don't follow it like I once did. But when it comes to the Super Bowl, I typically try to get home and watch the last half of the Super Bowl after church. And I remember the uh, 2017 Super Bowl. It was the Patriots and the Eagles that were playing. And that first half, or not the Eagles, but the Falcons. And the Falcons absolutely wore out the New England Patriots in the first half. And it looked like it was going to be a runaway. It was 21 to 3. They'd end up going up uh, by 25 points. And, uh, but at halftime, something interesting happening in the dressing room. And uh, Bill Belichick, if you ever watch him on the sidelines, he looks like the most miserable person that's ever breathed a breath of air. But he went into the locker room, and uh, he, there, there's no recorded message of what he said, but Julian Edmond was asked, and he said it was something like this. He, very calmly, he said, not yelling, not screaming, not cursing, he said, you're a better team than that. You're a better team than that. In the first half, you didn't play your best. I'm expecting better of you in the second half. So go out. Do your job and finish your job. And if you know the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say, in the last minute of the game, the New England Patriots came back and won the game. Now, in our Christian life, you know what the Lord tells us? I expect better of you than that. Now go out and do your best, finish strong, win, win the game. And that's what the writer here is saying because we had talked about previously in chapter 6 those who were supposed Christians and uh, they had gone back into Judaism. But now he's talking to those believers who are still strong in the faith and he's telling them, listen, I expect better of you. Now go and do great things. Move forward. So let's read our text, Hebrews 6. Please stand with me. Verses 7 through 12. The writer says, For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed whose end is to be burned. But, now here it is, transition, but, beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, for we speak, though we speak in this manner, for God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show that same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. That you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Father in heaven, I pray that you would just open our minds and our hearts today to understand this passage of Scripture. Thank you so much for your incredible mercy and grace. Help us to grow, to develop, to imitate Christ. And Father, that others would see us and recognize that we truly are born into the family of God and that we love you. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. 
Now, follow me with this illustration. It's probably going to seem a little odd at first, but uh, how many of you have eaten at an expensive steakhouse? Now, I'm not talking about swingles (laughs) or teeters. I'm talking about an expensive steakhouse. Raise your hand. All right. Now, you know what? The very first time I did that, it was a Ruth Chris Steakhouse. And it was in Jacksonville, Florida. It was with Don and Helen, Rick and uh, Ralph and some of our closest friends at that time. And we went, and I had no idea what a Ruth Chris Steakhouse was. But when we approached it, I realized immediately I was out of my element. We went in. And they brought us menus. And on those menus, they had single items listed. Now, I'm used to sides, if you know what I mean. Everything was listed and priced as such. In fact, it's called a la carte. That's French for very expensive. Now, it actually, it, it doesn't, that's not what it means. It means by the card. Each thing is particular by the card. You pay for each item. But I looked down through that, and I thought to myself, I had, we had our two children with us and another student that was from the church at the time, and I was thinking, one, two, three, four, that's five of us. There is no way that I can afford to pay for this meal. I decided to eat crackers and drink water. But my wife gave me an ugly look, so I ordered a steak. But I want you to know, that is not the typical restaurant that I frequent. Restaurants that I frequent have a main entree and sides, like baked potato, french fries. Uh, They they, they might have a a vegetable. That's the type of restaurants that, that I typically go to. Now, you're saying, where are you going with this story? Well, I want you to understand, where I'm going with this story is, when you get salvation, there are a lot of side issues that come along with salvation. You get a lot of other things. You just don't get salvation, and then you go to this one, and this one, you get a lot of things involved with salvation. And I want to explain about four of those to you. I could probably give you a list of dozens, but I don't have time for that. But I'm going to give you four of those things. The very first one I want to give you is fruitfulness. Fruitfulness that produces assurance. Our writer is talking about those of you who are true born-again believers, you need to go on into salvation. Go on deeper and enjoy the fruits that I have for you. Now, when you think about Bible times over 2,000 years ago, you go back, and because it was a, a, very, a farming society, if you will, that if they didn't produce in the summer, in the growing months, then the winter was going to be very bleak. They may not have enough food to get through the winter. So if, if their crops didn't produce... It was bad news. So they didn't need the thorns and thistles that we read about. They needed the good ground to produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold, as Jesus would tell in a parable. But what we need to understand is this. They needed that so their families could survive and thrive. And if they had a good crop and it produced a lot, you know what it gave them? It gave them assurance. It gave them assurance that they had enough food to get through the year. Now, I want you to understand what God is saying through this is this. Once you have salvation, you have assurance. You have assurance that I am with you. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. You have assurance that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, and I'm not going to extract it from the Lamb's book of life. You see, the same is true in the in the farming community and the spiritual realm as well. And He has given us all of that that fruit that has been placed in our life. So how do you know that you know that you're a child of God? You know, I've I've come across a lot of people that say they're a child of God, but I want you to know they're the meanest people you'd ever meet. And you know what? God hasn't given us that spirit. Of, of, of that critical condemnatory spirit. God has given us a spirit of, of joy and peace and long suffering and all the fruits of the spirit that I will get to in just a moment. But you think about that and go, go ahead and put it, that's okay, put it back up there. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Now watch these nine fruits. Now I say fruit. There's one fruit, but nine, if you will, nine flavors, okay? Well, nine flavors of this fruit. The spirit, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faith, Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. 
against such there is no law. Now, if you want to go back and hear about every one of those, all you have to do is go in their archives because I preached a series concerning those nine fruit uh, some time back. And you can go back and find that. But here's what, here's what the Lord is saying in our Christian life, the assurance. You know, when, when the Lord gives us the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, here's what it does. It produces fruit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's what the fruit of the Spirit does in our life. And that's what God places into our life. Now, what you have to understand is John 15. In John 15, he says, He is the vine, we're just simply the branches. And by this, my Father is glorified, our text says, that you bear much fruit. And, and, and what we are to do is to stay adhered to the vine. You see, a branch can't produce anything on its own. It doesn't have the ability. Those nutrients have to come up through the, the, the root system, through that vine, and then out to the branches to produce anything. So listen to me. If you're producing good fruit, it's not because you're good. It's because God is good through you. He is working himself in you to bring fruit, to glorify him, but to give you assurance that you're part of the family of God. So our entire job is just simply stay attached to the vine. How do you stay attached to the vine? Well, when you're born again. But I want you to understand, you stay in the word of God. You pray to him. You come to fellowship together. That's how you stay attached. And those nutrients begin coming through you. So that's our job. Now, have you ever ran into a person that is unloving, but you love them still? Not easy, is it? And, and you're wondering to yourself, why do I love that person? I'll tell you why you love that person, because the, 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 the nutrients from the, from the Holy Spirit of God's coming up through you, and you're loving them as Christ loved us, because you see, when Christ loved us, we were enemies of God. And he still loved us. And our responsibility is to love others. But you can't whip it up and do it yourself. That comes from the Spirit of God. As he gives you that love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, faithfulness, kindness, gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. Have you ever been in a situation where you've got bad news from the doctor? Or have you been in a situation where you've heard something real tragic that's truly going to affect you and your family, but then you had peace? You had peace like a gentle river flowing. I mean, you didn't get upset. You didn't lose control. God was just working in you, giving you this supernatural peace that you know that you could not have had on your own. Have you ever been there? I mean, God does something through you that you're just like, that's the Lord. You know what he's doing? He's giving you a assurance that you're a child of God. You see, so many people worry about things that uh, never are going to happen in their lives. I mean, they, they just, they worry about anything and they worry about everything. And God says, don't worry. Trust and obey. You say, what is the opposite of worry? I'm going to tell you, it's faith. Faith. Faith in His finished work. Faith that He'll do what's best and that He will not give up on you. So you stay attached and you love as He loves you. And, and, and I'm telling you, it will do incredible things in your life and in your ministry. It's a great blessing to know that you're saved and to have that assurance of your salvation. Satan wants to keep you doubting. Well, I just don't know if I am or not. I, I did a lot of things yesterday for God. It's not about your good deeds. It's about the good deeds that he does through you that gives you assurance that he's living in you. Now, the second thing I want you to see is in verse 10. It's a love that produces service. Watch what he says here in verse 10. For God is not unjust to forget your work and the labor of love which you have shown toward his name. Did you catch that? The labor of love that you've shown toward his name. You say... You don't love others to get God to love you. You love others because God first loved you. Now, the great passage that we hear about Jesus speaking is, is uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 23 or 22, verses 37 through 39. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, all your soul, 
and all your mind. And this is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So here it is. How, how, do, how, do, what, how do we figure this thing out? Well, first you love God, and then you love your neighbor. It's because you love God that you can love your neighbor. But there's a, there's a big issue here that's missing, and if you don't understand it, you're never going to be able to truly love God and love others. So the very first thing that you have to do is you have to love yourself correctly first. You have to love yourself correctly. I'll explain that in just a moment. And then secondly, you love your neighbor compassionately. I mean, truly love your neighbor, not just put on an act, but it it comes from a deep abiding faith and an overflowing love because you love God and you love your neighbor. And then third is love God completely. You love God completely with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, everything that you have and if you don't love yourself you can't love God or others now reality check okay loving yourself loving yourself does not mean that you're saying that you saying to yourself in the mirror how great thou art <laughs> that's not what loving yourself is it, it's it's not this this oh i'm so Amazing. I'm so good. Everybody must love me and must think the world of me. That's not what I'm saying at all. You know, before cell phones, the only way that, uh, that you could see the one you love most was to look in the mirror. <laughs> but now, with the advent of cell phones, it's selfies. It's selfies. You know, I can honestly say I have never taken a selfie because I don't like the way this guy always looks. And my wife has taken many pictures of us. And people take endless selfies. And I've noticed, have you noticed that when you look at them on the selfie and it's on the Facebook or posted somewhere, and then you see them in real life, and you're like, hmm, hmm, that don't add up. Now, you know what I mean? I mean, because we try to give our best self. I used to love reading Dear Abby. I don't read it much anymore. I don't even know if it's out there anymore. But uh, I, I, I remember this one, so I kept it, and it came in, into a play for today's service. He wrote, Dear Abby, I'm a guy who has everything. Can't you just feel the arrogance dripping? I'm smart and handsome. Women are always flocking after me and telling me how good-looking I am and what a marvelous personality I have. I'm beginning to find this boring. How can I discourage these hopeful females? I love her response. She wrote back, Dear CW, just keep talking. (laughs) Now you talk about cutting a fella to the bone. That's exactly what she did. But you see, loving your neighbor as you love yourself means that you see yourself in light of how God sees you, not how you see you. And you see how God sees you as you open up the book, and it reveals, as James said, as a man looks into a mirror and sees what he is, so when you open the Word of God, you see what you are. And I was speaking with one of our deacons this morning, and I said, you know what, I, I, I'm not the person I want to be. Are you? And, and, and I, I see faults and failures and, and limitations. And, and, but I know this much. If I stay close to the Lord, the Lord is going to continue to reveal to me His truth. And then those things will begin to fade away. God loves us even in the midst of our imperfection. But He doesn't want us to stay there. But I want you to know, you're a trophy of His grace. And it's all by grace that you've been saved. Through faith, not of yourself. It's not because you're good looking handsome it's not because you're smart it's not because of any of those things it's not because of your hard work it is because of his marvelous eternal grace that you're saved and that is the only reason when you see yourself as a sinner saved by grace but deeply loved by God, then you can love others. And the, you know what the best way to show that you love God is? Do you know how the best way to show you love God is? It's not just coming to church. You know the best way to show you love God? Listen to me. Don't miss this. It's by loving others. That is the best way. 
The best way to know is by loving others. I want you to listen to this passage of Scripture out of 1 John chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. It said, Beloved, if God so loved us, which He did, we also ought to love one another. Now watch what it says now. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love has been perfected in us. Now did you see what that said? Did, did you catch that? He said, if you love me, you're going to love others. You know, we have some men in our church who've done some great things, some ladies who've done some great things. I mean, I, I'm not going to just point this one and that one out, but we've had a lot of men that have gone and built ramps for widows and handicapped, not, not members of the church. They did it because they cared. We've had a lot of our ladies and some of the men from our church who've taken food to people that they don't even know. They just do it because they need something. And we've had so many people just to reach out. And, and, and you know, when we have a woodcutting day, people show up and cut wood for church members that are elderly. And it's absolutely amazing that we can come together and do that. And it's because we love God and God's working through us to minister in His name to love other people. And that's His love causes us to care about others. You know what? That's the greatest thing about becoming a Christian is you don't become egocentric. You can become Christocentric. And when you become Christ-centered, you start thinking about others. And what can I do for them? Not what can I do for me. Now, I want you to think back with me. After Jesus rose from the dead, uh, there was old Peter. Remember Peter denied Jesus three times? And, 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 and Peter, uh, Peter just said what he thought. And, uh, you know, I'll never deny you, Lord, than he did three times before the rooster crowed. And there they were sitting on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he and Jesus. And, and we have this, this passage in John 21. And, and I'm not going to read it all, but if you'll notice three th- times through there, Jesus asked Simon, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Then tend my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. And, and, but did you notice he didn't say, if you love me, do, he, he just says, he didn't say, if you, if, if you love, do this. He said, do you love me? If you love me, this is what the natural byproduct is going to do. If you love me, you're going to serve others. You're going to take care of them. He didn't say, do you love stinking sheep? He said, do you love me? Do you love me? Because I, I want you to know something. If you get involved with people, it's going to get nasty. It does. It does. Why? Because every one of us are fallen. Every one of us are sinful. Every one of us stink. (laughs) And it's sometimes difficult. But when you love the Lord, that love is going to come out to other people. And you'll love difficult people as well as you'll love those who just love you. Third thing I see that's quite important in our text is this, the diligence. Diligence that produces patience. Now watch in verse 11 what he says here. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. So you be diligent diligent to do this yeah and and when you're diligent that means you're detail oriented that you're focused i need to do this and this and this and this and this and and and, and you're not just taking that shotgun approach but you're you're very diligent to do every single small detail and the writer is commending these true christians the hebrew christians he said you're hard workers that's a great virtue stay at it don't stop and god will reward the diligence stay faithful endure to the very end now i thought about this passage and i was thinking about my grandparents my grandmother has been dead 27 years my grandfather has been dead 37 years and they helped raise us and uh if i guess if i were to summarize in one statement what they said to us that meant more than anything else. I believe that it would be from my grandmother. Here's what she always said. If you can't say anything good about somebody, don't say anything at all. That's what my grandma would say. My grandfather. I thought about what he would say. 
and, and, and ha- what he said and what he implemented and, and, and what he produced and, 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 and what he tried to replicate in our lives. And I think that Grandpa would say, if a job's worth doing it, then doing it with, do it with all of your heart. Give your very best. And you know the overriding principle that they said to us? Two things you have to have in life. Number one, you have a deep abiding faith in God. Number two, you go get an education and life will be better. And all five of us did. Because we believe that our grandparents had our best at heart. You know, the Bible speaks of uh, serving the Lord with enthusiasm. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says, My dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable, always enthusiastically for the Lord. For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useful. Did anybody watch the Alabama-Auburn game yesterday? A few of you did? Now, I don't know about you, but I saw two very enthusiastic coaches, especially on that field goal to end the first half. (laughs) If you watched it, you know what I mean. Nick Saban was not a happy camper. But I want you to understand something. We are to be enthusiastic. And unfortunately, as believers, sometimes we're more lethargic. We're just kind of, oh, it's no big thing. Just kind of going along to get along. But you know that word enthusiasm that was in our text? You know, that word actually comes from two Greek words meaning uh, that, are, that say in theos which means in God. And when we're in God, we should be enthusiastic. We should be excited about what He is doing and what He has done and what He will do. Unfortunately, too many Christians are apathetic. I don't care. I don't care. Man, Wes, we're just talking about a worker showing up. that's, that's, That's major, isn't it? But when they care and they show up and they work hard, that's even better. But you know what? When you're enthusiastic, people will get enthusiastic. But if you're just, the Word of God says, how enthusiastic is that? Man, we, we need to be excited about what God has done in our life. I, 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 one of my favorite uh, theologians, he's gone to be with the Lord many years ago. It's Howard Hendricks. He was at Dallas Theological Seminary. He, he, he was always going and speaking. And uh, he, was, he was on the plane one day. It was in line to fly out and had some problems. And they were sitting there and sitting there and sitting there. And if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. It is no fun. You are confined. The air doesn't blow enough. You're hot. You're irritable. And, and uh, people were starting to get irritable. And uh, they were criticizing. They, they were getting on to the flight attendants. Flight attendants have nothing they can do, okay? It's not their problem, not their fault. And Howard Hendrix watched this one flight attendant who was so compassionate and, and so helpful to everyone on board, never gave a critical word, always gave encouragement, brought whatever they needed. And uh, when the plane took off, they got in the air, she came by, and he, he motioned her over. And he said, I would like to write a letter to, the, to, the, uh, to your company of how well you handle that difficult situation. I am so amazed at how you handled that. And her words to him were, I don't work for this company. I work for Jesus. I just draw a paycheck from this company. I'm representing Jesus. And he said that was so revolutionary to him. And I want you to know, imagine how that would be if we went to our jobs and and we were representing Jesus rather than our company. We would work a lot harder. We'd be a lot more faithful. We'd do a lot better job. We'd work with enthusiasm. Now, how many of you have read Mark Twain? A lot of people have read. You've heard, who's heard of Mark Twain? A lot of people have heard of Mark Twain. Some have read Mark Twain. A great humorist, great writer. But there was another guy that was probably uh, right up there with Twain at that time. He died in the 1880s, I believe. His name was Josh Billings. And Josh Billings was just an old uh, humorist, country humorist. And I loved what he said about a postage stamp. He said, we could all learn a lesson from a postage stamp. 
He said the value of a postage stamp is found in its ability to stick to one thing until it gets to its destination. Now that's good, isn't it? We just need to stick to one thing, loving the Lord with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And we'll see that one thing. Fourth, and I'm going to finish up, is in verse 12. Now I want you to see this. Faith produces patience. Watch this. That you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Who through patience and faith, through faith and patience, they get to the end. They finish the course. You know, in the Bible, you go back to the book of Hebrews here, you go a couple chapters over to chapter 11, and you're going to find all of these men and women of faith that walked the earth, and, and they lived difficult lives, but yet they had faith, and they had patience, and they endured to the very end. And there are 16 different men and women that are written specifically about in that 11th chapter, and many others that are mentioned. But, but you know what? <clears throat> Our faith is tested when it comes to patience. And uh, people have said to me, boy, John, I need to pray for patience. And I said, well, that's probably true, but I want you to understand something before you pray for patience. Often it comes disguised as trouble. <laughs> and you will have to endure you know, thinking about this, I have married hundreds of couples. Hundreds of couples. I've had them shake. I've had them stutter. I've had them sweat. Almost had them pass out. I've seen about everything you can imagine. But this, this one guy, after we finished the ceremony, and he was shaking and he was sweating and he was about to pass out, he was doing everything that you, you could imagine. He came to me after the, the ceremony and after we went through the line and, and he stuck out his hand and he said, Brother John, I'm sure glad that's over. And I held on to his hand and I looked at him and I said, Son, it's not over. It's just starting. <laughs> and I, I want you to know, it's not over. It's just starting. The same is true with being saved. When you come down an aisle and you give your heart to Christ and you go and you're biblically baptized, you are just starting. It ain't over. It's just begun. And now we're to have patience. We're to be faithful. We're to finish the course. And we are to always remember we're going to be tested Jacob was. You know this, you may not even know the story of Jacob, Old Testament story. It was Isaac's son, and he wanted a wife, went to his uncle's. Now, I don't advise you going to the family reunion to find a wife. It's not what I'm saying, but that's a biblical story. And uh, he, he decides, he falls in love with, with uh, Rachel. She's beautiful. Well, Laban says to him, I'll give her to you, but you've got to work seven years. And it says in the text that it's like the seven years passed in a moment's time. The big night came. They don't have bright lights. They met in the tent. He goes in. He's excited. Wakes up the next morning. It's not Rachel. This is the ultimate bait and switch. It's Leah, the ugly one. <laughs> Not my words, the Bible's words. He didn't love her. Laban said, well, it's, we have a policy that our oldest daughter marries first. But if you'll work seven more years, I'll give you Rachel. So he worked seven more years to get the wife that he wanted. Now, men, men, would you be willing to work that hard for your wife? I can almost hear it. Are you crazy? <laughs> but think about it. The testing of our faith produces patience. But here, I want you to hear me. Faith produces faith. If you've never committed your life to Christ, 
you need to take the first step. And then all these benefits and blessings will come along with it because all of those fruit of the Spirit will be poured into your life. It will be your responsibility to mine them. And then God will do something incredible in you. Let us pray together. Father, I do pray that you would just touch the hearts and the lives of every here. And I thank you, Lord, that your grace is sufficient. And I pray, Father, that uh, you would just take this simple message out of the book of Hebrews and you would break it and bless it in our lives. And, Lord, that you would draw men, women, boys, and girls to yourself, that they would want to taste the good gift of salvation and then continue fighting the good fight until the very end. Father, I pray for those who are on the fence that need to join this local assembly. pray they would come today. I pray, Father, we would, we would here at Southern First Baptist Church desire one thing, and that's to glorify Jesus Christ and to finish the course that he's put us on. We thank you that you love us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Stand and come as you have needs. Thank you for being here this morning, and tonight, I wish you would come back. Our students are going to do the worship service for us, and we pray that you'll be here for that. And also, we have a lot of things coming up this, uh, this month, so be praying about that. Be faithful. Be here. Be blessed by it. I know Tom, next Sunday night's got a Christmas message. I'm going to bring one next Sunday morning. Then we'll have the cantata on the 15th and our children's program that night. And then on the 22nd, we'll have a service at 10 o'clock. A worship service at 10 o'clock. No Sunday school. Worship service at 10 o'clock. And then our next service will be the memorial service or the next Sunday. So I want you to be praying about those things that's in the bulletin. Remember, God is good. Brotherhood Saturday. If you can come and help, we're going to work in the building for just a few hours, and that will be it. I want a, I want a store. That's right. I want a gifts. So if you don't know what to do, call Kelly. And I don't see her. I think she's still. Oh, she's back there. Call Kelly, and she'll tell you what we need. Call Sandy, she'll tell you what we need. Uh, call Josh, she'll tell you what we need. Call me, and I'll tell you I don't have a clue. Okay? <laughs> so don't ask me. Don't ask me. Thank you for your presence today. Aren't you glad that we're nearing the Christmas season? I mean, we are so close, you can almost taste it. 24 days away. All right. Show somebody. Remember? Remember what I said last week? Show somebody that you truly love them. Do something special for somebody else this season. Don't make it about you. Make it about somebody else. Ray, dismiss us. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day. Lord, we thank you for everything you do for us. Lord, we ask you to watch over us, guide us in this coming week, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs>